Okay, Tony, good to see you again. We're here at Hood Aerodrome in Marsat in New Zealand again. Basically the home of World War I aviation, not only in New Zealand, but arguably the world. Um, we've got an aircraft behind us here, which is the Royal Aircraft Factory BE-2C. And I believe this is your favourite World War I aircraft. It is. This, for me, is the aircraft, I guess, that really sparked my interest in World War I aircraft. So why was that? Um, people of a certain age, like mine and yours, when we go back to the 70s when we were kids, might remember a BBC programme called Wings. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Captain Triggers. Captain Triggers, yes. that's him. Yeah, yeah. Alan Farmer and Charles Galen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fantastic programme, and this is an impressionable child at the time. Uh, that it really rung a bell with me, and so my first, I guess, real interaction of anything that involved World War I aircraft involved a BE-2. Me too. Right, several BE2s right. and it was that was really what triggered it and the opportunity now to be standing here beside one and I've actually previously had the privilege of, of riding in one it just it's absolutely magic and to me it's it's the epitome of the beginning of military aviation flying in World War One and it's just amazing even though the aircraft was uh, possibly so flawed in so many ways that <laughs> yeah. its main problem being it did what it was supposed to do so very well that um, once again, the problem, I guess, is something being designed by someone who's in an office and not being shot at. Yeah, and what it was designed for was to be stable, wasn't it? Stable, artillery spotting. So yeah. you'd fly across the lines, watch where the shells are landing, fly back to our side, flash a message by, message by Morse code down to the artillery to change the range of their guns. And for that, it's absolutely perfect. Fly straight, it flies levels, what more could you want? Of course, someone on the other side is hurling high explosive shells at you and they've worked out exactly how high you're going and how fast you're going and you know, there's other aircraft there with guns on who um, would really quite like to see the end of you and yeah. if you have a look at this one you'll see one of its uh, stunning features for a military it's aircraft awkward. is it's unarmed although this one to be honest has had one of the later modifications done to try and give it a little bit of sting and you'll see the the framework up above the pilot's cockpit and of course another great bit of design the observer sits in the front so he's got a really good view and if you've sat in there you know even more you've got a uh, little windscreen covered in castor oil you've got the engine and everything right in front of you you look over the side you've got wings you've got rigging you've got all sorts and your view of the ground really isn't all well, that a big, flash there's a big wing in the way here that's dead right so um, the observer sitting in the front possibly wasn't one of the better ideas and you know when it came to the re8 they swapped around and put the observer in the back seat and gave him a bigger gun which also wasn't a bad idea either so, but you'll see this one's got a mounting there for a Lewis gun and also one on the Cobain strut just on the uh, right hand side yeah, of the sorry. windscreen there as well and um, it looks like a mighty fine idea from here but you find when you're actually sitting in there firing forward with a Lewis gun on that front mounting if you fire dead forward you'll take your prop off you've got a tiny little angle of about sort of yay much where you can actually fire forward yeah. before you then start hitting your rigging and going further around you'll then start taking struts off and as well. there's an awful lot of rigging in here as well there's, isn't there? I mean, I mean you, you don't have much scope to actually move a, a weapon around in here without hitting something. Well that's dead right it's really sort of once you're inside it's almost like flying inside a budgie's cage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, you, know, you, you could then lift the gun off and on this one you could then pop it on the mounting there to fire backwards but you know first of all you're flying around you've actually physically got to lift the gun up and they're not light you don't really want to drop it because that's just clear dope linen on there that's not going to take any sort of abuse whatsoever and having a Lewis gun hitting it is going to tear it there's your flying surface gone and that re does really make for quite a long day I, I'm not entirely sure that I'd be wanting um, at five six hundred feet or higher to be moving a Lewis from that front Cobain straight mount into something above the pilot particularly if you've got somebody behind you wanting to shoot at you with the risk of actually dropping a fairly heavy weapon on top of your pilot. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. Which would be fairly nasty as well. Yeah, <laughs> once again, it doesn't really make for, you know, sound engineering. And if you are firing straight back, you know, you've probably got as much chance of either taking your pilot's head off or your tail as you actually have of shooting whatever is attacking you. Yeah. And um, the aircraft was so slow and so stable, which made it perfect for what it was designed for, yeah. but also meant that once they came up with the Fokker Eindecker with the forward firing machine gun, Thank you again for Wings and educating me on all of this in the first place. Um, you really were just a sitting duck. You had no way of shooting back. You basically had to hope that the pilot flying towards you was pretty much a tough shot because otherwise it wasn't really good. Now, can you correct me if I'm right, I, my memory of Wings is that the BE-2 that was flown in that wasn't a full-size one. Are you 
I think you're right. I have seen photographs of it, and it does look shorter. I mean, we're, we're slightly smaller, whereas what we've got here is actually full size, fully accurate, yes, 100% B2. Yeah, and mm. it's it's a large aircraft. You know, when you yeah. compare it with the, the camel or the pup that we've just dragged outside and parked alongside here, um, it's an awful lot of aircraft. It's a lot of wing units. Yeah, it's only got. Uh, uh, the original Renault V8 that these ran was only 70 horsepower. This has got the RAF V8 in it, but I would doubt that it's got any more than 80 or 90 horsepower at the most. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's not a powerful engine and there's an awful lot of aircraft and rigging and drag to get through the sky. Right, right yeah. But, you, know, you wouldn't want to be in it for too long. The other thing I really found in the front cockpit and the observer seat there is they must have had very, very short legs. I mean, I'm not a tall person, but I was sitting in there with my knees jammed right up against the fuel tank, basically unable to move. It was really uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. yeah. So for a long stretch out over the lines doing artillery spotting or mapping or whatever, being in a cockpit like that for an extended period... It'd be very unpleasant. Very unpleasant. Um, would be yeah. the polite way to put it. I mean, And that's with nobody shooting at you. That's assuming, of course, that no one knows you're there, but a nice yeah. clear blue sky with one of these chugging around, it, it didn't take the enemy very long to realise that you were actually there. Yeah. and. Yeah. Um, because you were so stable and they knew where you were flying back to, they knew that your artillery battery was wherever it was. Yeah. Um, very easy for their anti-aircraft guns to work out exactly where you were yeah. and also for them to send fighters up to get you. So, 1970 BBC, thanks very much. Wings, that's what turned you on to the BE-2C. Absolutely. Anything and else about it that, that, you know? I just, for me, it just, it, it, it's, it's the epitome of early World War One aviation. It's a large, spindly biplane, lots of struts, lots of rigging, very slow. It's well, we're, we're still cool only talking thing. 10 or 11 years, really, after the Wrights first well, exactly. flew. So yes. it, it was the, 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 the start of, of aviation in World War One. at it least. It was. I mean, Things it, changed rapidly, but this was where it began. They did. This is, you know, this, this is the very beginning. These aircraft were flying at the start of World War One. By mm. 1918, only four years later, this was so antiquated that, uh, that, yeah, um, so it's as, as one of the terribly good things about war is that it does push innovation very quickly and, and something and there was absolutely nothing wrong with this aircraft when it was designed and when it was first put into service it was absolutely wonderful but um, things changed so overtaken. quickly that all of a sudden what was the best aircraft that was available suddenly became the worst aircraft for the same job yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's just the whole thing. It's, it's the childhood memories, and I just love the, the aesthetics of the aircraft. I think, in an ungainly way, it's, it's got more than just charm. It has its own charm, it has its own quirks. I just think it's, it's brilliant. Hi, I'm Tony Haycock. If you've enjoyed this video and like to help to support the Historical Aviation Film Unit, please hit the join button now and come along for the ride with us. If you've already done this, we really appreciate it and we look forward to bringing you more of the same coverage that you've been watching now. Thank you.